It's difficult to know where to begin with this sorrowful tale. I want to take you on a journey to ensure complete transparency and clarity. However, this is different from any other journey. I want you to imagine yourself as a ghost. I know it may sound wild, but research has shown that ghosts do not interact with the living. During this eerie hour, I suggest a test to highlight the significance of preserving a clean family history, name, and lineage. As you will observe, what starts with the factual telling of how children with abnormalities were handled ends up becoming your family's story, unbeknownst to you. So, push us off into the waters of the macabre. In the past, it was common to conceal physical abnormalities in children. Even in today's materialistic world, there are prenatal tests available that can detect such disabilities and provide the option to terminate the pregnancy. We often reflect on the past to see how different the world used to be, but many of the things that matter today are not that different from the past. We are all just trying to achieve our goals and live happy lives. So take a moment to reflect on your family and the individuals who came before you. They paved the way for your life today. Imagine what the world will be like in 120 years from now, when you, your loved ones, are no longer present. Your legacy may live on through memories, stories, or your impact on others. However, it's also possible that your family line may end, and the life you envisioned for yourself and your family may not come to fruition. Regardless, life moves on, and we should cherish our time with our beloved ones while we still can. As time passes, your family name and house become associated with disturbing lies and scandalous tales. One such story involves your family allegedly hiding a deformed child in the attic of your estate. Despite historians' best efforts to defend your family's reputation, these lies continue to spread throughout society, eventually becoming the only thing people associate with you and your family name, which you, being long gone, can do nothing about. After all, who speaks for the dead? This situation attracts the attention of those interested in the macabre such as writers and rumor mongers, who thrive on such stories. As a result, your family's name is no longer a representation of all the good you have done for your city and state, but rather a ghostly tale that continues to haunt you even in death. This is what your family has become. A ghost story, a salacious lie, and a tale for an overpriced ghost tour. As the tour ends, people on it retell the stories, each a little less factual some more embellished, so the lies spread in the abyss of accepted truth. They found it entertaining and a way to learn about a city they had never visited. But for you, a spirit of the past, your story has been forever lost. No one remembers your laughter, triumphs, failures, or place in the world. Now imagine that your family name is Lemp, and that your family has a legendary reputation for the services you provide to the city. Your family invented the original German lager beer and was responsible for the refrigerated rail line to ensure that the beer did not spoil during transportation to destinations across the country. Your journey started with a humble beginning at a small market, but through hard work and determination, you built an empire that became the eighth largest brewery in the world. It's remarkable that you achieved all this despite being a migrant from a homeland that lost a revolution. Unfortunately, in the eyes of the people of this new world, your legacy is only defined by your death and the suicides of your immediate family. Now imagine a lie so scandalous that it is hidden away on the top floor of a mansion. A secret is so dark and grim that it tarnishes your family name, making people reluctant even to investigate it. It is a sensual tale of the hidden one, Lemp's Monkey Boy. Lemp's Monkey Boy is a popular ghost tourist topic with local families often sharing stories about it. But is there any truth to this rumor? Have people reported sightings of a ghostly boy with a severe deformity that was kept hidden from society? Or is it simply a retelling of an old world story about a monster in the walls? The mistreatment of children with disabilities has been a reoccurring problem throughout history. It can be traced back to ancient Greece and Rome, medieval times, the Renaissance, and the Victorian era. Unfortunately, this issue persists in modern times, as seen in the current plotline of the Lemp's Monkey Boy. 
Every prominent philosopher throughout our history has touched the subject. Aristotle believed heavily in eugenics, saying, As to the exposure and rearing of children, let there be a law that no deformed child shall live. Of course, this didn't age well, and other more compassionate leaders, including Jesus of Nazareth, came to the aid of these children. As the great physician, Jesus paid particular attention to those with disabilities. In the New Testament, Jesus is frequently credited with performing miraculous cures for those who are lame, blind, and otherwise disabled. From there, early Christian churches did their best to care with the children with disabilities, which was a direct contrast to the Roman Empire, which tossed disabled children into the Tiber River. During medieval times, the responsibility of caring for children with special needs was divided between the church and the kings. The church took care of them while the kings used them as court jesters and fools. However, it was not until the Enlightenment that great men started studying the humane effects of caring for and educating these children. Newton and Galileo contributed to the physical world, and disabilities were confusing to them. As time passed, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke became interested in rationalism and the study of human nature. Locke's idea of the mind being a blank slate suggests that individuals with intellectual disabilities have the potential to develop their capacities through experience, the senses, and reflection. In the past, great individuals like Jacob Rodriguez from Portugal taught deaf mutes to hear and speak by using muscle vibrations. Similarly, Valentin Hay demonstrated that blind individuals could be taught to read by embossing print. These successful efforts encouraged people to take an interest in educating other individuals with disabilities. And so the world evolved and eventually caught up at the turn of the century, the Gilded Age, as Samuel Clemens once put it. It was a time of the Industrial Revolution, the era of the Lemps. But how were children with deformities treated? Does the case for hiding children with deformities hold water? Or is this story a retelling of one of the most famous cases of a hidden child? An heir to be, but with deformities so great and monstrous, it must have been chambered and kept in secret. The most profound case comparable to the monkey boy is that of Castle Glarms and the monster within the walls. Between the 1840s and 1905, a mysterious secret circulated throughout Europe. The secret centered around the ancestral castle of the Earl of Glarms, located in the Scottish lowlands. The castle housed a puzzling enigma involving a concealed room a secret passage, scandalous events, solemn initiations, and shadowy figures seen at night on the castle's battlements. The enigma captivated two generations of elite society until the secret vanished shortly after 1900. According to one version of the story, the secret was so terrible that the 13th Earl's heir refused to reveal it to him. Nevertheless, the mystery of Glom's endures, sustained by its association with royalty. After all, the heir was the grandfather of Elizabeth II, and by the fact that some members of the Bowes Lion family insist that it's genuine. Glam's castle, mentioned in Shakespeare's play Macbeth, was built in the 15th century, with walls up to 16 feet thick. Since then, it has been the seat of the Strathmore Earls. In the late 18th century, the castle was primarily empty, and in the year 1790, a young man named Sir Walter Scott spent a night in one of the rooms of a castle. Sir Walter Scott's experience of Gloms was recorded in an account published in 1830, where he mentions that he started feeling uneasy as he heard the doors shut one by one after his guide had left him for the night. Gloms Castle was said to have a secret room only known to the Earl, his father, and his heir. However, the most exciting thing about Scott's account is what it doesn't say. The novelist wrote nothing to suggest that the castle's hidden chamber had an occupant. Yet, within a half a century of his visit, it had begun to be rumored that the room concealed an unknown captive, a prisoner who had been held there all his life. The first reports of Glam's unknown prisoner date to the 1840s according to a correspondent in the Journal Notes of Queries, written in 1908. The mystery was told to the present writer some 60 years ago when he was a boy, and it made a great impression on him. The story was, and is, that in the castle of Glam's is a secret chamber. In this chamber is confined a monster who is the rightful heir to their title and property, but so unpresentable that it is necessary to keep him out of sight and out of possession. There has been a lot of speculation about the identity of a captive who was kept hidden away in a castle. Many people believe the captive was a member of the Bose Lion family, and some suggested that he might have been the firstborn child of the 11th Earl or the heir of the Earl's son, Lord Gloms. Supporters of this theory point to Douglas's Scott Parage, 
which states that Lord Gloms and Charlotte Grimstead had a son born on October 21st, 1821, who died. However, some people believe that the child did not die and was kept hidden away inside the castle. There have been debates about the appearance of the monster of Gloms. In the early 1960s, the writer James Wentworth Day spent some time at Gloms while working on a history of the Bowes Lion family. He heard from the then Earl and his relatives about a legend that a monster was born into the family. This creature was their heir, who was too terrifying to look at. The family couldn't allow this deformed caricature of humanity to be seen, not even by their friends. The child had an enormous barrel-like chest covered in hair like a doormat. Its head ran straight into the shoulders, and the arms and legs were toy-like. Despite the twisted and warped body, the child had to be raised to manhood. The family entrusted this job to the factor, who kept the child safe and occasionally exercised him. The Earl of Crawford believed that the family made up stories to amuse their guest. His diary entry in 1905 reads, The lions talk freely about ghosts and invent stories to suit the idiosyncrasies of each guest. He added that he solved the mystery of the alleged secret quickly, as the secret is that there is no secret. Do you think that Castle Gloms is reminiscent of the legend of the monkey boy? The story goes that the boy was the illegitimate child of Billy and Lillian Lemp and was raised in the attic's servant quarters due to his disability. However, this retelling is inaccurate because Billy and Lillian never lived in the mansion, which was used as an office for the brewery at that same time. The legend of the Lemp mansion begins with a neighborhood child gazing upon one of the attic windows. The child notices a boy, but not just any boy, a boy who looks like a monkey. And just like that, a legend was born. William Billy Lemp II had chimpanzees at his stables, which his brother Edwin had gifted to him. During his divorce proceedings, Lillian, his now separated wife, mentioned that he had scared a young William Lemp III by feeding the chimps the wings of birds that he had ripped off. So, this tale can be manipulated by the readers of the newspapers of the day. And with a little embellishment, the story can grow. The story revolves around a child and a monkey, which seems plausible. However, the claim that the child would be hidden from sight seems unlikely. The Lemp family was known for their philanthropic ways in St. Louis, and they frequently donated to orphanages and organized Christmas parties for underprivileged children in the neighborhood. Was Monkey Boy part of the Lemp family, or did he belong to someone living in the mansion's apartments during the period between 1950 and 1975? Could it be possible that one of the tenants had a child with a disability? For that, I turn to my partner in crime, Jeremy David King. Welcome back to Haunted Garage. I hope you enjoyed that whole thing on hidden children and monsters and castles. I think I did a pretty good job there again. You did. I really bring you in, don't I? You're good at it. So we're going to talk a little bit about our... I hate calling him Monkey Boy, but Zeke. But before we get into the Zeke thing, are you following us on the social medias at the Haunted Garage? Are you thinking about sponsoring? Why don't you go ahead and send us an email at askus at hauntedgarage.net. If you have something spooky going on in your house, and I'll tell you what, this radio show has actually conjured up some people out there having us investigate their stuff. That's true. It's still happening, guys. So if you have those types of things, we keep it all private. We never share your information. That's ask us at hauntedgarage.net. Go ahead and throw an email at us. Throw us a high five um, or just say, hey, man, I love your show. Or I don't like this show. Can you do this? Or if you have topics, hey, can you cover the bubblehead people that used to live up in North? Um, we'll cover it. Okay. But we're not going to cover bubblehead people until I get an email that says cover the bubblehead people. You know, I've been out there before. I'm sure you have. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you've had an experience too, Jeremy. Not there. Okay. Thank God. Yeah. No. So anyway, getting back to... Our own little monkey boy. And this is kind of a strange story, but you can actually watch the old episodes of Ghost Adventures and some stuff on YouTube about people talking about this kid named Zeke. Right. And, you know, like the first time I heard Zeke, it came from the Dave Glover show. He used to do these Halloween investigations, Mm. and they caught this EVP that's like, I'm Zeke. That's the first time I heard that name. I've heard the monkey boy story. I even thought I caught a picture of it when I was a kid. But the thing is, you know, like they legit 
had a, uh, chimpanzees. It did. Like that was in, it's in the divorce decree that Lillian Hanlon accused Billy yeah. of feeding birds to the chimpanzees in front of her kid. And chimpanzees are... They're carnivorous. Yeah, they're carnivorous. And actually, when we do the Edwin breakdown, um, Edwin was an incredible limp. And they all are. They all had their own specialties. But Edwin was the one that really kind of crafted uh, what we know and love about the St. Louis Zoo. 100%. And carnivores were not his thing. He actually swore off carnivores forever. And he only brought over, like, birds and, and um, herbivores. That's true. That's so, true. There's some funny stories we'll share about that. Too. Yes. Yeah, the panda one is my favorite. But we'll get into Edwin when we get through the entire family. For right now, what we're trying to do is kind of go through the house, do some house cleaning, and then we're going to debunk this story. Now, I think we did a good job. I don't hear about this story as much. Yeah, after all our uh, presentations. But... It's still out there. It's still out there. So we're going to try to put the nail in the coffin and, and close it once and for all. Do we believe that there is a child in the attic that lives in the crawl space between both bedrooms, which is horrifying if you've never yeah. been Yeah. Like, I've been up there in the in that crawl space. Well, it's not really between the bedrooms. It's, like, all the way around the perimeter. Yeah. And it's tiny. And it's where, if you see the little tiny windows... Yes. Actually, that's is where. So there is access to those windows. There could have been a face in those windows. Yes. And, but this is where we get back to. We know exactly how many lamps died in the house. Truth. Then you have to debate on whether or not Julia, who died of stomach cancer, in, yes, her mom, who died of a cerebral hemorrhage stroke, yes. her dad, who died of bronchitis. And then her husband, which was a self-inflicted gunshot wound. We As also were two of her sons. Billy and Charles. So that is the nutshell of those haunts. Right. So when we return, we're going to talk about the possibilities of what this thing could be during the Flophouse years. Yes. So we're back talking monkey, talking all, th talking all things primates here on the hit station, 94.1 Primate FM. What? Uh, yes. <laughs> it's about That's, as real as Zeke. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing <laughs> is I can't say that there is no Zeke. That's true. I can't. What I can say is that please stop saying it's a disabled down syndrome, illegitimate child of Billy's. It's right. not. So that's getting back to, so how did the, how did the lore begin? The lore began out of, an EVP session. But prior to that, it was done on, I believe, Ghost Adventures. Oh, I think it was way before that. Yeah. So this thing has been There's haunting. been stories about it for, <laughs> for decades. Yeah. This has been haunting the Lemp Mansion. Because but the, it's not a Lemp. Lemps would have never done something like this? I don't think so. I okay. really don't. And then when you talk about Billy and Lillian Hanlon, once again, these two... Having an illegitimate children, you do not know these two people. Number one, if it is Down syndrome, you don't know when a baby's in an infancy. Not no. especially back then. No. So the baby would have been public. It would have been known. It would have been named. And there would have been record of it. Correct. So it's not that. B, they never lived in the mansion. That's the other one. So it's not, well, it's probably Julia and Williams. No. What? The last born child was in 1883, and that's my favorite, my love, Elsa Lemp. Correct. Okay. Elsie was the last born child. Elsie was the most caring, and so, I mean, she gave so much money to children's hospitals. Yeah. They all did. They were all very, very charitable people. So the idea that you would say that this family would do something so salacious and so terrible. It really just zeeks me out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it, you know it's it's so non plausible. Right. Like 
the thing, it, what makes way more sense, first off, is the name is Zeke. Ezekiel. So that, Ezekiel. That's mm-hmm. not like any other name in the family. That's correct. And we have the entire lineage of the name. And the names are pretty American and patriotic. And they... they John, And Adam. they all, that like they reuse them. Right. You know, Charles Adam. Yes. Named after his grandfather. Correct. You know, Lewis. You know, like all these names. Named after his great grandmother. And they're all being reused. Like they're they're tributing or his their, grandfather his grand his grandmother would have been Louise yeah and so he when Louis has a child he names her Louise. Louise so that's that's the the catch right so Billy and Lillian do have a child his name is Billy right <laughs> when the Billy third. was a child I guess they called him Willie because that's how they wrote it on the census here's a thing here's a tidbit too just so um, as you guys know the research here I'm sure you're out there and you're like man these guys really know. They're limp history. They're pretty amazing people. I'm going to go to Instagram right now and be like, I'm going to follow these guys because they post really cool pictures. And that's the Haunted Garage. Anyway, shameless plug. We got to do what we got to do. But yep. here's the thing. When you look at Billy the Third, right? William the Third. Right. Okay. That's their child. <laughs> okay. Correct. So he dies... Very young. He di- he's born in 1900. So he's he, he's born a year before Frederick dies. And this is all going to become clear to you in a couple episodes. So just hang tight. I'm sure you're going to listen to these over and over again because there's a lot of information coming at you. But not as much information is going to be in the next couple of weeks because we're going to dissect each one of the lumps. You're going to be lump experts at the end of this. The only person we're not touching is Elsa. We will go over Elsa when she was born and stuff like that. We are not getting into the case. That is something that is dedicate it to a documentary we've worked on for 10 years and we're not going to give away anything. I will tell you that we're trying to make it premiere this year. We're really shooting for November. We probably are going to make that date. We're very excited about it. That film will turn heads. That film will make you rethink everything that you ever thought about this family and being a local St. Louis person. Um, And it's also going to make you put a lot of other things in into question. What was really yeah. going on during the 1920s here? What was really going on with these gateway families? What was really going on with the women of society in St. Louis at this time? Truth. So with that, we'll jump back into thinking a little bit more about what possibilities this has within the Lemp family. Why Zeke? Why invent a story about an illegitimate child that plays tennis in the attic? <laughs> So uh, I heard Zeke can defeat a brick wall at tennis. Yeah, of course he can. And the thing is, too, is that this is ex- this is the realm that he lives in. The realm that he lives in is, of course, um, the addict. And you know, the funny thing is, going back to the Dave Glover thing, I don't think they caught the EVP in the attic. <laughs> For some reason, I, I I don't I can't a hundred percent tell you, but. It was either in the hallway on the second floor in between the uh, William Limp Suite and the Lavender Lady Suite, or I actually think it they caught it in the Lavender Lady Suite. Hmm. So Maybe that's where the illegitimacy came from. Oh. Because that was never her room. Right. But it was named that. And that's clever. It's what the Limp Mansion does. So they know exactly where you're staying, what room you want. Right. Um, because all the rooms have names. Yes. Yeah. There's Charles, Edwin, Lewis. Yeah. There. One of them has the claw fit tub. So if you want the tub. Yep. So, um, the the thing that too that I would remind you is as we jump a little bit ahead, and to Jeremy's point, we really can't rule out that maybe there is a kid that haunts the lamp mansion. We can't. We, we can say that it's not a lamp. <laughs> right. Because, you know, the truth is that the shiny shoes man, the lady in white, they could not possibly be limps at all. Correct. This could be people who were living there during the flop, we'll just call it the flop house era, you know, 1950 to 75. They could all be totally related to somebody who passed away in that house during that time. We can't find records of that stuff, though. We've looked. We've looked and looked and looked. I'm sure somebody died in that house during that time period. And the stories that we hear are amazing. I mean, 
little Dick Pointer, who was one of the original purchasers, told us when he bought it in 1975, he pulled a small black Chevy, like, engine block out of the second floor. Yeah. So it doesn't sound like it was a nice place to live. No, and that's the thing that I, I mention a lot. People are always like, well, why why is Edwin one of your favorite people? And I think Davison Mogart, who I don't think he does anything with Lemp anymore, but he was one of the foremost authorities when we were coming up and in, in, in trying to do this film over you know, 10, 11 years ago. Uh, he was also really attracted to the, Lemp, the Edwin story. Um, we've actually been to his estate multiple times. Uh, very good friends. Very, very, very good people. Um, they're actually in our documentary and don't Um, trespass on their house. Yeah. And don't go near their house. Actually. Like if you can see their house, you're trespassing. Yeah. There's a little weasel writer in town that went right on their property and thinks he knows everything about that house. He doesn't know anything about that house and they want to keep it that way. They have preserved that house. They have brought that house back to the way Edwin had it. And thank God there's people like this. Their house is not an attraction. Their house is, um, for them. And it was Deb's passion to do that. And she was very successful at that. And, and we just absolutely love them and everything they've been able Beautiful to do. Beautiful house. Yes. Beautiful people. Right. And, you know, I, you'll hear some of the stories in the documentary when we interview them, but the, what, they, what they walked into during the 70s in Edwin's right. house. Um, so the thing that I do love about Edwin is this craziness of he's born in 1880. And then he's going to die in 1970. So what you're saying is he got to see the 454 SS Chevelle. <laughs> he did. Yes. Right before he died. That was the most important tip. But yeah, it's still haunted garage, guys. Um, no, but he's going to come into this world on horse and buggy. And he's going to leave watching a man walk on the moon. And then a big black Chevy. And a big black Chevy. But in that time period, he's going to experience... Not only the success of his family, but the fall of his family. Literally, he watched everybody pass away. And he watched the company pass away. And when you read about him, and I know this is the Monkey Boy episode, but I want you to keep in mind that there's other people that are affected by this story. And it's people like Edwin right, that would have caught wind of this. And watching the home, because he was one of the kids that actually grew up in the Lent mansion. Yeah. And we could only confirm two of the kids live there. That's correct. And it's him and Elsa. Yes. Cause at this point, um, Hilda was already married off. Yeah. They were all, uh, most of the other brothers and sisters were in their twenties. Yeah. So the, the reason why I brought, I bring this up is that because when you really look at a story that's engaging and sad and all encompassing, it's that one. And we focus on these things that may or may not occur in the house. This is what we get right. back to actually loving this family and this whole thing about whether or not, you know, Edwin was never married and was he this, this, and that. And, and sexuality and all that stuff, we don't care about those stuff. There's no reason to make anything sensationalized with this mansion, with this house. This is like when Hollywood comes into this set, and God, if they ever came into this set, they would destroy this film. Because what they would want to do is rewrite it. And I'm sorry, uh-huh. but you don't need to write anything. It, it is there. The, the story has a lot of meat and potatoes to it. And whether or not this kid exists is the only thing that I can think of is during the flop house years. Now, what does that mean? Well, when Charles dies, he committed suicide on May 10th, 1949. When he ends his life, 80% of what he had which was about $3.1 million. And Jeremy did the math <laughs> earlier today, an yeah. inflation calculator. It was like $45 million. Yeah, he was quite um, rich. You know, the- and that goes against everything. Oh, they all committed suicide because they lost all their wealth. Yeah, that's not true. That's a lot of money to be losing your wealth. $45 million in today's money yeah. can do a lot of things. Even in Biden's inflationary years truth <laughs> but um with that said though you're absolutely right there that's another thing part of conjecture oh they well they lost all their money and they didn't have anything that's not true dude they all had money yeah and the thing is too is that like there was a lot of pride there was a lot of ego there was a lot of sadness but i don't think necessarily that was the root to why charles now the other thing 
about Charles too is that we don't know if he had arthritis. There's this we couldn't find anything on Could it either. Could not find anything. I've heard this story since I was a kid. Right. That he he had you know how would he commit suicide because he had arthritis and couldn't pull the trigger and he was cloaked and hid around. No, I couldn't find any of it. Yeah, and so the reason why we're mentioning Charles and Edwin is because Charles and Edwin, Char- Edwin is going to take care of Charles' estate when he kills himself. That estate is going to go to Marion Hawes, which is a very interesting story that we're going to get into in the next segment because you don't want to miss who Marion Hawes is and who she married and this how this whole thing connects. But Charles is going to leave her 80% of that money and the rest is going to be split between the rest of the family members. Um, and the scariest thing about this entire um, dissertation is that from 1949, his basically his will is not going to be settled to around 1953, uh, 1954. So when we return, we're going to talk all about Marion Hawes and then get back into that monkey boy with the flop house years. Welcome back to the show. Hope you liked the break. Hope you had a nice little chance. Hope you got settled back in. If you're joining us on a nice Saturday night, spending your time with me and Jeremy. And why not? There's no really other better way, in my opinion, to spend a Saturday night. I think I'm awesome. I think you are too. That's why we hang out. My next door neighbor, John, he's loving this show. Hey, Um, John. Yeah. Hi, John. And, you know, uh, we, we just have some some really good feedback. And if you have feedback for us, once again, it's ask us at hauntedgarage.net. Be sure to email us if you want to be a third-party segment, if you want to sponsor, if you want to tell us about a haunted location. If you want to tell us about a topic you want us to research and to cover, then maybe we'll have you on one of the segments and we can talk about it with you. And you'll be like, thanks, guys. I really appreciate you. High fives around the table. But for right now, in our final segment, what we're going to do is wait. No, yeah. We're going to do Marion Hawes. Marion Hawes is a very interesting character in the Lemp saga. She really is. Not a lot of people talk about Marion. I, I mean, I think we're the people who talk about her. But there was a time after her father died that she was in headline news. Yes. Marion Hawes is the daughter of William's most prized son, the apple of his eye, Frederick Lemp's daughter. Marion Lemp. Yes. And the reason why this story is so hard is because we don't have answers. Correct. What happens is absolutely daunting. And for the life of me, me and Jeremy could not figure it out. We've gone down rabbit holes trying to figure it out. But long story short, Frederick was the apple of William's eye. It is said over time and time and time, that he was supposed to take over the brewery. And a lot of people have quoted that, but that's not the truth. No, because Billy had already done it. Yeah, Billy was already Billy is already in, in charge. Yes. And there's, an, there's a newspaper article that we can point you guys to that talk about the sons of the Lemp Empire. And it is going to Billy. So, right. yes, he might have loved Frederick, and I'm sure he loved all his kids. When you really learn about William, and you will in a couple weeks here, you're really going to love who this person was. And one of the things about William Lemp Sr. was he was selfless. He was a guy that was humble. He was a guy that did everything for his family. And if it didn't align with what he wanted, then he basically started to organize his life so that his family had their needs met. That's the kind of Correct. selfless person that he was. Not only was he selfless within his family, he was selfless around the neighborhood. He was always charitable. He would always help somebody that get on their feet. He always gives somebody a job. And he provided so many jobs in the neighborhood of South City to all these brewers that came over from Germany. You have to understand, over 45,000 German immigrants migrated to St. Louis. Legally. <laughs> Legally. And they were doing it the right way. And William was providing them with jobs. Another big thing, too, is that Germans that came out of that revolution were abolitionists. They didn't own slaves. This is a huge thing for us, too, because there's so much conjecture around this city and and like all these things that we did. Yes, slaves existed here. But at the same time, we were a population of Germans that didn't believe in slavery. We were against it. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about this family, too. The Lemps never owned slaves. The Damon Nils did. 
during that time period. Yeah. They believed in it. They were French. They were Southern oh, sympathizers. Those they, French. Their house is even Greek revival. It even looks right. like a house from the South. It really so, does. The big yeah. columns. Mm-hmm. So when you look at it from that perspective, this history lesson that we're giving you is really all about, you know, how Marion fits into this monkey boy equation. And it's kind of strange. Um, but what's going to happen is William Lem Sr. is going to take his life in 1904 on February 13th. When he does that, he doesn't have a will. Correct. He actually has a note. And the note says, everything my wife can handle, and she will take care of my kids and my grandchildren. That's what he says. That's a paraphrase. But that's exactly what he says. But Julia doesn't do that. Julia takes the money, and she would separate it amongst her children. Mm-hmm. And just a little tidbit about Elsa. She Elsa's young at this point, and she knows her daughter Elsa is a nonconformist, and that if she was to give her all this money... She might have blown it. She might have spent it on a race car or two. Yep, she had a couple. She had a couple horses and a couple race cars. So what she does with Elsa is she puts all her money into a trust until she turns 30 or she gets married. And the two proprietors of that are Charles and Billy. So Billy and Charles are actually watching Elsa's money and she's given a stipend and an allowance to live on. But if she gets married, she gets an advance of $100,000 plus access to the rest of it without having to turn 31, which was common practice back then. And it should be today. Um, 21-year-olds don't know what to do with $30 million, <laughs> uh, which is inflation, right? So they're going right. to split about $12.5 million, which if you did the math, it's a lot of money, guys. These guys never have to work a day in their life, and their kids probably wouldn't have to work a day in their life. But where the money doesn't go, is to Frederick's daughter, Marion Lemp. And this would cause one of the most sensationalized stories in St. Louis history, where we put a young child on the stand trying to get what she believes is her father's split of the money. Right. And it goes to two trials. And and there's this terrible newspaper cover that we'll put in corn on the macabre on our website if you're not looking at that section very cool stuff i've been writing some articles we got one on the black eyed kids we got one on mothman and the mothman effect but also we have that that terrible newspaper with marion this beautiful child sitting in a chair in a courthouse and her grandmother is unrelentless she's not going to give up that money and she doesn't win she actually loses the case and so marion walks away empty-handed. Now, they're given a stipend. They're given money to take care of them, but they do not get a share of that $12 million. Now, some would think that's where the story ends, but it doesn't. Nope. Marion would keep this, fester this, and bottle this, and she would grow very close to her Uncle Charles. When Uncle Charles, I think that the kids, and we see this when Elsa dies, that she does leave a, a portion one eighth of her money to Marion. Right. And so we saw that there was a relationship there. I'm not trying to say that the Hawes family was salacious by any means. The Hawes were actually senators. They were politicians. They were brokerage. They're very, very smart intellectual people and rich on their own right. So she does marry Richard Hawes and they have children. I think Richard Hawes III comes out of that. And Christy Bond is going to come out of that, which uh, was an incredible lady. And we got to talk to her, and she wrote an incredible book called Gateway Families, and she should pick that up. Um, that talks all about her history, but all about the Gateway Families. It's incredible. Right. But getting back to the story at hand, Marion Lemp, as you know, by this point, does not get a cut of that money, but she grows close to Charles. When Charles dies, 80% of his wealth goes to Marion Lemp, and as part of that wealth, she receives what, Jeremy? The house. 3322 13th Street. So she gets the actual house in 1949, and this is May, okay? By 1950, Marion Lemp takes the Lemp legacy, that house that has been standing there since at least 1885, and turns it over to the federal government or the state government and makes it a flop house. What is a flop house, guys? A flop house is an intermissionary house where people were traveling back and forth um, during times of lows. Now, this is 1949. This is right after war. These aren't the best. It's booming, but it's not the best time also. There's a lot of things going on. Right. Give it like five to ten years and everything's like amazing. Yeah, but we're going to go into Korea. (laughs) 
Right. So we're, we're going back into war. And so there's a lot of people that are traveling across the states and they're going to need a place to stay for three days a week, month. They're picking up these odd jobs across the country. With that comes people that don't have the money. With that comes the wrong element. So within a couple of years, the Lent Mansion, which once stood as this golden, gilded, amazing mansion, right, has fallen to ruin. Now, whether that was Marion's intent, we don't know. But we do know this. She had options. She could have moved in. <laughs> I mean, it's a big house. It's like 7,500 square feet. Yeah. 33 rooms. 28,000, right? 28,000 square feet is the lot. It's unbelievable. That's now. Now, remember that it was bigger then yeah. because the highway hadn't been through there So they yet. still had the both carriage houses. Yep. And probably the acreage. Yep. They probably went to the river. Yep. So she chooses to do this. So this is a crazy story that you might not have heard. You can look up all of this online. Nobody talks about this. We want to invent stories like Monkey Boy and not talk about these really cool mysteries that happened. Why did Marion make that move? Well, why did why did Julia not give her any money? Yeah. And these are questions we don't have answers to. And no matter how hard we dig, no matter how I guess we could have asked Christy Bond. I guess, you know, I think Richard Hawes III is still out there, but I know that he really didn't want any involvement. The coolest thing about him is he had his grandfather's, or I guess great-grandfather's, desk. Oh, that's He had super Frederick's cool. desk, I believe. And um, he actually reached out to Stephen Walker at some point. They talked a little bit. And actually, Stephen Walker was the one that gave us that contact. And we mm-hmm. talked to Christy Bond for a minute. She was going to do the interview, and then something happened. I think she got sick or something. But I hope she's doing well. I haven't heard from her in a minute. But she was very um, wonderful and awesome and wanted to talk. And she just had some stuff that, I mean, she was one of these people that really enjoyed and loved her family and knew a lot about the history, so much so that she does write this book called Gateway Families. You need to pick it up if you ha- if you want to read something great. I know there's a writer in town that thinks it's all malarkey, but let me tell you something. When family writes stuff, I have a tendency to believe it more because they lived it. Right. So this is her 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 aunts and uncles and grandparents and everything. Yeah. And so all around this area, which was once considered Millionaire's Row, all these houses are kind of turning into these apartment buildings. Yes. And with that comes the wrong type of element. And Cherokee Street and 13th Street become one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in St. Louis. Oh, yeah, it was rough. So much so that by the 1960s, they want to raise the whole thing and throw the highway right through it. Yes. But... A community is going to come together and they're going to try to fix stuff up. And this is some of the pictures that we actually have. Um, And you could see from the most amazing pictures from 1875 to about 1900, these beautiful pictures of Lent Mansion and the illustrations they did of how cool and gilded that mansion was. And then you start looking at, you know, the pictures now and it's sad. I mean, the porch is gone. The, the structure is gone. And this is what happens when you try to take a, a mansion like that and you build it. And so with that, there are these communities moving in. We know that there was a lot of drugs in the area. We know that there might have been people that had the criminal element. Right. We know that there could have been kids in that building that might have, you know, something terrible could have happened to them. True. Like station or, or trafficking or sex or whatever is going on. But Whatever happens in this period is where we believe that this kid Zeke might have come out of. That's where he comes from. I so. think that a hundred I think it a hundred percent and it's it's gonna be I don't know, impossible to prove and but on the other hand, nearly impossible to disprove. Yeah. I mean we can't find any of these records. We, how many times have we tried to find people who died in that mansion during that time? Yeah, and, and that's the thing too. Transient people, <laughs> transient people in general, it's tough to track them. And if you really want to get into a salacious nature of Mound City, which is what St. Louis was called before everything else, I mean, most of St. Louis, most of Crondelet, most of where all these millionaires row, even where that brewery stands, all the way up to the arch, was a potter's field. 
Or Indian burial mounds. That's correct. And a lot of people died from two pandemics here. Um, okay, we had the Spanish flu, and we had the cholera outbreak. Right. So, I mean, we're still finding people. I mean, they just found a body, a couple bodies, when they were building Ikea and the new highway. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And they brought in Amanda Clark from the Missouri Museum and being like, yeah, this is probably cholera. Because she does a really cool tour about the cholera outbreak of St. Louis. And if you haven't been on that tour, she's now with the History Museum. You need to do that. You need to do any tour with Amanda Clark, by the way. She's the best tour guide. Um, If you want to do a historic tour guide and really get down and dirty, Nene Harris is about to do hers. Um, she is the number one historian, in my opinion. She knows so much about St. Louis. And the thing I love about both these women, they love the city. So it's not just like they hire tour guides to, you know, talk about and, and read a script. They are, when when Amanda has a tour guide, um, and my friend just did one recently, and he asked me, do you know Amanda? I'm like, yeah, I do. She's in my documentary. Um She's like, he's like, that is the best tour I've ever been on in my life. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, if you're, if you're wanting doing some really cool tours, I mean, she has the Badass Babes tour. She has the Color Outbreak tour. And I think she has a couple more. And she, if it's not her on the tour, the people that she's trained are just as good. So check that out. The other one is Nene Harris does the walking tours. If you really want to learn about these buildings, the families... Nobody knows it like Nene Harris. And those are the two tours that we can offer you going around because you're going to go right by the Lent Mansion. And Nene doesn't touch on Ghost. I don't, Amanda kind of stays away from it too. She gives you a couple different perspectives of what's happening. We they're are kind both, of the ghost guys. Yeah, they're both historians. Yeah, and they're incredible. And they're female and they're awesome and we support them. And it's just nice to see that we can get behind people that are doing great things for St. Louis that actually love their city. Um, as far as the Monkey Boy is concerned, debunking it or not the thing that the takeaway here is that it's not a limp it can't be okay it can't be if if it was a limp this family was the kardashians of the time uh-huh. they 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 talked about billy and and lillian's you know their divorce they had people running into the courtroom and running out to feed news yeah. and it was in the newspapers all across the country it was a spectacle i mean you can see some pictures of the cars lined up in the streets it's a famous one in the city hall uh, cars just lined up on the street watching this this almost had the attendance of the world's fair right i mean it was and it was it was colorful I mean, we have the transcript. We'll read it to you guys when we cover the Billy and Lillian saga. The toxicity of those two um, was just, they were both terrible yes. to each other. Uh, I mean, he, he, she was so beautiful that he didn't trust himself with his insecurity. And she was not any better either. Right. Hear the story. So pretty terrible. But they didn't have an illegitimate children because once again, that case was so high profile. It would have come up. It totally yeah, like, somebody there's no clean. way they would have they would have been able to hide this exactly especially the way Billy treated the staff you don't think that would have leaked and right gotten around town as much as this guy was firing you know servants left and right come on somebody's gonna tell yeah so put your head on right really think about the deductive reasoning there like why would the lumps do that why because here's the thing if they did do that and it got out it would ruin their name and everything they built in the city right what they would have done is probably take care of the kid True. And would have been great with it because that's what they did. They took care of so many different charities around the time. So really think about it when you're getting into it. Is there a boy in the attic that wants to play with you? Is there a boy in the attic that wants to scare you? I don't know. I haven't seen him. I haven't seen him either. But I'm not going to put it past any other paranormals that might believe in him. But the thing I do want you to believe in is the fact that there are ghosts in the Lent Mansion. And Zeke's not a limp. (laughs) At least Zeke's not a limp. And there's delicious food. And I recommend going Sundays and eating all you can eat. The fried chicken. It's unbelievable. It's so good. Yes. So with that, I think this kind of concludes probably the last time we'll talk about Zeke and the monkey boy. If we do, it's only going to be in jest. <laughs> we'll bring him up occasionally. You know, maybe it's the monkey boy. Um, so from all of us here at Haunted Garage, thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm Frankie. I'm Jeremy. Hey, we're going to be seeing you real soon.